This video is sponsored by Autodesk. I'm going to show you something quite embarrassing. I'm gonna go through my first ever built project, the first project that I ever worked on in Revit, and I'm going to pick it apart and show some of the biggest mistakes that I made when I was first using Revit and compare it to what I would do now that I've got quite a bit more experience with Revit. Hopefully this gives you an idea of the correct way to do things in Revit as opposed to the wrong way to do things in Revit. So let's go ahead and open up this first project. Now this was a renovation and extension of an existing house. It was quite a difficult project, I must say, for a first project. But straight away, the first thing that I noticed when I opened up this project is the disorganization of the project browser. As you can see, just under floor plans, there are, I'm going to say, almost 30 different plan views. Now, obviously, that is way too many views that you'll ever need to show in a drawing set. If we go through some of these, you can see that I've got a couple of bathroom plans. I don't know which one's the right one, which one's the wrong one. There's some plan details, which obviously they're going to show up under plans as well, which is fine. There's a lot of random plans like doors and columns. I don't think this is even anything. <laughs> the first thing I would say is make sure that your project browser is organized. What I would do is I would go through all of these drawings and I would delete the ones that aren't in use. I think some of these were just for working through different things inside the model. But once you're finished with something, delete it or get rid of it. You can always bring back a floor plan in the view tab by going to plan views, floor plan, and then bring back whichever one you want but for example bathroom plan there's a plan there but then there's also another plan here I would probably delete the one that's not on a sheet and then you're cleaning it up so you don't have to try and go through all of these 30 different views to find your normal ground floor plan which I think is the ground floor proposed. I would go through all of these views, delete the ones that aren't in use, rename all of the ones that are in use to something that's, you know, memorable, something that actually works, keep them all consistently capitalized rather than some of them being in all caps and some of them not being. In my advanced course, I show you how to properly organize your project browser using parameters inside of the project browser. I highly recommend going through that lesson, which is also available on YouTube. So that's just the floor plans. There's also all all of these different 3D views. I have no idea why there are so many 3D views. Holy jeez. There's probably like 50 3D views. Um, elevations, like that's a lot of elevations. We did have a lot of internal elevations and stuff, but again, you can organize them under a single heading, so it's a lot more easier to navigate. Sections, I mean, the fact that there's probably 50 sections as well, just get rid of the ones you don't need. That would clean up your floor plan as well with all these random section markers. I would literally just go through and delete anything that you don't need. So that's the first thing. Now, the next thing that I've noticed in this project that is really bugging me is the fact that I've changed a lot of things in a single view rather than doing something once and then applying it to all of my views using say view templates and changing the override graphic settings in the view templates. For example, if I were to have a look at the screen overlay I've done to show what's new, what I've actually done, which just bugs me so much about this project is that I've changed everything in here by going to right click override graphics and view by element and then changing the color there. That is the most disgusting way that you can do this. In future projects what I would have done is gone to the manage tab and changed the phasing. You can go to phases and then change the phase filters and the graphic overrides for everything new to be green and then once you do that it's literally going to do that job for you so then every time you have something new in the project you're not going to have to right click that element override the graphic in view which is just i don't know how i went through this whole project doing that for something that just literally took 10 seconds to change <laughs> Um, yeah, but it's not just that. It goes for a lot of things. For example, even half toning all of the furniture. How I've done it in here is by going override graphics by element and then having it ticked as half tone. What I would do instead is go to the visibility graphic override settings, which is under uh, VG or VV. What you can do is say go down to furniture and then click half tone for everything in here and apply that. Now it won't actually let me do that in here because I've got a view template set up except I've set up a view template which is under architectural plan but I've pretty much only used that view template on this view even though I've got 30 different floor plans 
Uh, this is the only one that's the proposed floor plan, which is going to show all of the new stuff. So I really didn't need a view template for that. I could have just changed all the visibility graphic override settings inside this view singly. So that's just another thing to note. You want to minimize the amount of work that you do by using view templates and changing the visibility graphic settings for each category rather than doing it for singular elements inside of the project. The next thing that I've noticed is that I've heavily relied on 2D drafting. For example, I've used a lot of masking regions and detail lines and things like that, which is really bad practice. So <laughs> this round dining table here has been drawn in as a masking region when I really could have just found a 3D model of a table or built one myself in five minutes by using a 3D element rather than a 2D element like this masking region, the 3D element is going to show on every single view. So you make that object once and you place it in and it's gonna show all over the model. That's the whole point of modeling in 3D. Whereas this is sort of going back to the AutoCAD days where you're gonna draw it in here on this floor plan, but then on every other single view, you're gonna to have to draw it in as well in order to to match up what's on this floor plan. And that's where it can get really messy is that you've drawn in something in 2D on one view and then on the next view it's changed or it's completely different. And then your builder comes back to you and is like, why is this got a table on the floor plan but then in the elevation there's no table like do we put a table in there it can cause room for ambiguity which you don't want on your drawings you want things to be clear as to what is being built what's actually there every line you draw on your drawings is something that can be built in real life now this wasn't just for my floor plans i heavily relied on these 2d drafting bits for my details as well now for example i did end up changing it in the end because what i originally did this is a detail of one of the columns inside of the portal frame that we've got on the veranda originally i drew these in in 2d and i didn't actually model up that beam or i may have modeled up the beam but it wasn't sitting in the correct position so i thought oh well i'll just use a 2d uh, element and put it in the right position but then as i was saying before you do that on one view and the rest of the model hasn't updated so there was some real big issues that i had where the builder was asking me you've got this column in this spot on the detail but on the plan it's you know 200 millimeters out where's it meant to go and we actually had some big issues with that on site and me as my first project I'm freaking out because I'm like shit I've taken a shortcut with the drawings someone's picked up on it and it's causing issues it's causing delays on the build that can backfire and start to cause a lot of headaches for the client and for the builder so I ended up having to redo most of those details and actually model in those 3d elements replace all of the 2d elements with 3d elements saved a lot of headaches and I should have just done that from the start. I try to remind everybody that this is a 3D software. You don't need to rely on 2D lines and masking regions and field regions. That stuff's pretty irrelevant. If you look at my advanced Revit course, you'll see that you can do everything in 3D and you can use tags and you can use if you need to, you can go to detail components rather than those detail lines and field regions, masking regions, because that's the smart way of working with Revit. And you want to work smart because then you save time, you save yourself headaches, you have a fun time using Revit rather than a sad time, which I did trying to <laughs> work through this model. <laughs> now the next thing, oh, that really makes me cringe is that I wasn't using beam systems for the roof framing. If I um, hide this roof here, you you can see that each Perlin has been modeled in as an individual element and this is just the slowest way to work again if you make changes to the roof none of these elements are going to update and you're going to be stuck with the old framing for a new roof and then things get all out of line causes a lot of big headaches which i had to redo this roof maybe four or five times and each time i had to redo the structure from scratch and it just took so much extra time what i should have done is what i taught in two videos ago when i talked about beam systems and then i could literally change anything to do with the roof whether it be the sides of it or the slope of it anything really the plane that it's on and if I use the beam system it would update all of the structure with it rather than having to delete all of these individual elements and then redoing it I'm not going to touch on beam systems here go check out that other video that was sponsored by Autodesk as well now the next thing this isn't really Revit related but it's going to help quite a few people 
I think, just as a reminder anyways, is that if you do model up a existing building, make sure that you measure twice, three times, four times on site before you start modeling. Because in the construction process, I think we had to go back on site multiple times to try and get one or two measurements that we didn't have or that we might have gotten wrong. Every time this happens, when you're so far into the modeling process and then you realize that something on the existing building isn't right, it changes so much to do with the model and I remember having to sit through staring at the model for like four hours trying to figure out why the roof wasn't lining up and why it was at a different height than what it was in real life and all of these different issues came up because we didn't get the measurements right the first time on site. If you're doing a new build, life gets so much easier. I never really got to do new builds while I was working. It was always extensions, renovations, which take three times as much work. Another issue that we had pop up while in construction, if I go back to the ground floor plan, I didn't have one of the grid lines set up properly. Now I think what happened is that I accidentally moved one of the grids. Once they were in construction, they had already set up all the grids based on of one of the original drawings. I then updated the drawings after accidentally moving one of the grid lines and I didn't realize. I think the reason why I didn't realize is that I didn't have drag elements on selection off. If I turn that on, you can see that you can drag elements just by a single click. Whereas if I turn that off, it means that you can't drag anything from a single click. So I had this on and that meant that I accidentally moved something I didn't realize. This caused so many headaches down the track in construction because now I think the steel structure on site, they had dug holes and trenches for the footings and they didn't line up with what they were meant to. And that caused a big headache. We were able to find a solution to it. You know, something as simple as just accidentally dragging a grid, like you don't want that to happen. So make sure that you turn off drag elements on selection that will save you headaches. So while on this floor plan, I also heavily relied on text notes. Um, for example, you can see down here, it says tain existing rainwater tank. You can see that this room here is just a text note. This box underneath is just a text note. What this could be is a room tag. That's essentially what it's mimicking. It's mimicking a room tag. But I think because my boss wanted me to include this little box down here, I just did the quick thing and drew up a text note instead. Now, again, this is one of those shortcuts that save you time in the short run, but in the long run, they cause you so many more headaches, takes you a lot longer to then figure things out. So I should have just done these as room tags rather than text notes. This here could have been a keynote. I could have just tagged this generic model with a keynote. Anytime this pops up on a view, I can just use a keynote tag rather than say if I wanted to remove existing rainwater tank every time this rainwater tank sh showed up on a drawing I would have to change that text note on each drawing whereas if I had a keynote I would just change it in one place it would update across the entire model so that's the whole point of using tags and keynotes is that you change things once and it updates across the whole model if you use text notes like I have here and this changes to say the not the master bedroom well you have to then change it on every single view rather than just updating it once and it updates across the whole model. I did the same for things like the fridge, pantry, these could be keynotes. There are a lot of text notes everywhere. You get the point. Now the last thing that I'm going to point out before I make myself feel too bad for doing a shit job with this uh, <laughs> is that this uh, pool fence it's modeled in as just a basic wall so this is just a wall under architecture wall and then there's a couple of hosts that are put in every now and then what I would do instead is use a curtain wall. So you can go down to curtain system and you would make this a curtain wall rather than a normal wall. And then you can specify vertical balustrades for it or uh, vertical mullions. And then it would just be one system if this had to get moved, you wouldn't have to select all of these posts and move them individually. You can adjust them all at once. So for the sake of embarrassing myself by looking through my first model, I hope you've learned something. And if you are a beginner yourself, hopefully you can avoid all the mistakes that I made with this project. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to Autodesk for sponsoring this video. And I'll see you in the next one.